right, hello everyone, and welcome to the State of Human Design, May 12th, 2022. I'm Jonah Dempsey, and this is Michael Steenbeck. And we're back for part two. We were doing this yesterday, and uh, we got uh, into the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard stuff, and we were doing a little bit of analysis. Um, we were actually sharing some human design analysis by Dai Vin, for those of you who know Dai Vin from her Facebook or her Instagram. Um, that's Diana Ellie Vin, but it works out great that her name, you know, diving in. It's great. I used to think it was divine. I didn't realize at first it was divine. Yeah, yeah, I used to just read on Facebook. I go, oh, who's this divine? Oh, who's the wow? Divine really has some like interesting. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, this is my love language. Okay, when someone uh, when someone knows uh, all the lines and knows all of the exalts and detriments and stuff, I'm like. So that's a great first line right there. Mm, first line stuff. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in any case, I'm going to jump into, uh, let's see, I actually have, I'm going to put her info there. And um, so this is some analysis from Dai that we're going to be, uh, I'm just going to be reading. So we read some yesterday. Um, she was talking about the spleen and really starting with how you know, uh, I guess Heard has 5027, 2838, and 1858. Depp has a completely open spleen, completely undefined, and just only three gates pointing at it the 26, 54, and 38. So here's, um, unfortunately, I didn't get the graphic ready. I wonder if this will work or if this will just be worse. Oh, there we go. That's not that bad. So that's Johnny Depp. He's a 2 4. And as you can see, his spleen there is completely open absolutely completely open and then meanwhile we go over to Amber Heard and her spleen has um, a number of channels she has three channels you know three or four channels yeah all conscious yeah wow, wow they are yeah That's strange what yeah weird person. yeah and so um, yesterday we were just reading from dive in's analysis which can be found on the human design catalyst Facebook group and I think it may have been cross-posted I don't know if it's on human design and astrology. Um, you can find uh, Diana all over Facebook, but especially on the human design and astrology group, um, just helping people out, answering questions. And so she was writing, Amber's spleen is heavily defined via the three channels we just mentioned. So this factors into why Johnny couldn't leave. Um, and then we got into, okay, so this is about where we, we finished was or this is what, what we were just at, was the violence of the 1949. So I'll just kind of reread this and then maybe we can talk a little bit about 1949. Mm. So Dai Vin writes, another huge factor of instability is the dynamic between his defined emotional system and her undefined emotional system. And just really quick, I will show just so we have, um, this is her, oops. I really should have had the graphics, I apologize. So she only has 49 and it's unconscious, that's it. And then for him, that's his authority, and he's, uh, well, he's interesting. He's an emotional manifester, but not through the emotional manifested channels. He has, he has hanging gates in the emotional manifested channels. He has a hanging 22 and a 36, but he's actually a manifester, an ego manifester from that 2145, although he does have emotional authority. But his type is sort of cut off from his authority. It's always interesting when you see a split and when you see the conscious side is not the authority, you know, and the unconscious side is the authority. And also the type side is not the authority for him. His authority is on his like projected aspect, you mm -hmm. could say. Mm -hmm. His 1949 is projected, but then he has the 2145. That's what makes him a manifester. So, yeah, it's interesting to see. And he has the 81, which is um, also part of that. And conscious. So his two conscious channels are separate from his emotional authority. Mm -hmm. Just something to observe, not that there's huge interpretive content there other than it can be hard for those people to accept because they have such conscious access to, you know, everyone who's split is basically has a schism. It's like, it's not like schizophrenic in the common understanding of the term, but it is a schism. It's where the, it's, they are split. They are all split personality. And in his case, he's an ego manifester split off from his unconscious emotions. Mm. But in any case, um, sticking with the 1949. So he has the 1949 channel of sensitivity. This is about balancing one's own needs with the needs of others, writes Dai. 
There's a need here for shelter, food, sex, and love slash loyalty. This is also the stream of the marriage bond, also the stream of divorce. He compromises her only emotional gate, gate 49. She only understands the emotional field through acceptance or rejection. Wasn't this Ra's emotional system too? What? I'm pretty sure uh, Ra, Uruhu, had a, um, just had the 49. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I mean, I could be wrong. Here, here's this chart right here. Uh, yeah, that is his only emotional gate. Look at that. So Ra wow. had, and it was unconscious, just like for her. This is, this is Ra's only emotional um, gate. I'll just wow. show it really quick, just so you can kind of see what I'm looking at here. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this is Ra's chart, and he only has gate 49 from that hanging soul. I mean, that's that's hanging from the solar plexus. And he did kind of guillotine people sometimes, didn't he? Yeah. Well, and when he right, and I mean. <laughs> He definitely did. He absolutely did. And he talked about, I remember him talking about how when he gets emotional activation, everything for him is acceptance, rejection. Everything mm -hmm. about it for him, that's what gets activated in him. Mm -hmm. So I have a completely undefined solar plexus. What Ross says about the completely open centers, they don't even have just the not-self theme. They're too stupid to even have the not-self theme. Wow. Sometimes they go the opposite. You know, sometimes I accidentally confront not even realizing it or whatever because I'm so mm. beyond the binary of confronting or not. It's mm. like so, like, I don't even know what confronting means. Mm. Like, mm. the undefined solar plexus, most undefined solar plexus, they're going to have a very consistent way as a not self of avoiding confrontation right. through, yeah, through rejection. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's their, their consistent, fixed way. Everything in the emotional system, they get activated, they reject or they get activated and they accept, and everything they experience is, you're rejecting me, or you're accepting me, or I need to be accepted, I don't want to be rejected, mm. so I'm going to avoid confrontation and truth and be a goody two-shoes and try to tiptoe around all this stuff because I don't want to be rejected. Right. Just like a 22 might not want silent treatment or, and so on, you know, these mm. kind of fixed, fixed themes. But, you know, I have a completely open solar plexus, the theme is more... Um, it's it's just moving around, you know. It's it's not even it, it is beyond the binary in some sense. There there is a um, I don't know how far to go with this, but maybe dive dive in. She gets into the past life analysis aspect of it. I look at past lives too, but mainly through incarnation sequencing. Hmm. But she had said uh, I think something Ross said was that essentially the hanging gates are kind of unlearned lessons, and when you get to a completely open center. It's almost a question of, is this the last life before that center is defined? Or is this, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be so literal with it, but in some sense, there is a progression where the undefined is kind of like, there's no, there's no fixed not self theme left to work through. It's kind of an interesting idea. Mm. Now, I don't know how far to go with this because there's so many different aspects to incarnation. And, you know, and then my question is always, and then what if I have an undefined solar plexus and I screw up royally, my next life I have all these hanging gates? Is that what that means? You know what I mean? Like, I, like, I don't really know. I mean, I think some of this is somewhat mysterious still, but, mm. but if you are into human design and into um, the incarnation stuff, please post in the comments because I would, I would love to, to hear your take on it and, and how it works and essentially how it uh, interacts and so on. And if there is an interaction at that level, you know, I don't want to be too literal about it. I also have my own experiences doing past life analysis using evolutionary astrology and using archetypal astrology. And what I found was you can essentially weave a past life story that may or may not have anything to do with your past life, but it's a story and you can connect to that story. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you have Venus conjunct Saturn and Venus isn't aspected by anything else in your mm -hmm. chart. And I remember when we were doing more archetypal astrological analysis years ago, you said it's kind of like the, the beautiful woman comes to the party with the grumpy old man. If you want to talk to her, you have to go through him. Oh, yeah. You know, because mm. Saturn is aspected and then conjuncting Venus, which is unaspected, mm. and things like that. And so you can build a narrative, but then you can say, oh, well, in a past life, you know, you were the mob boss's wife and you mm. had this whole thing, yeah, and, you know, yeah. or whatever. You can right, totally, right. and you were locked away in your room and you weren't allowed this and that. And, and so there's all of these ways of kind of turning the, the astrological chart into a story that does resonate. It does click with people. Mm. And yet it's hard to know how much of that has to do with past lives. For me, the real use of past lives 
is in overcoming the need to live out certain themes in this life. Mm. Maybe you've had a past life in the Middle East, in this life you're obsessed with going there, and then you realize you had the past life there, you don't have to go there anymore. Right. Yeah, did that just occur to you one day? Because that is an explanation I've never heard before. Which that, really that occurred to me about six months ago nice. when I was going very deep into it. It was actually maybe even a year ago. It was before the last conference, mm. and it was when I was going really deep into base theory. And I was realizing, I mean, I was going very deep into fractal lines and base theory and like reincarnations because a big part of base theory is you're always the same base every time. And a big part of fractal lines is you kind of know the same people every time. And so I was kind of thinking back to past lives. And that's, I mean, it wasn't even really a thinking occurrence. It was more like a personal freedom that I felt mm. of letting myself off the hook right. from when I was a kid, having all of these fascinations. And mm. then as I went deeper and deeper into base, kind of realizing those fascinations maybe were not me. Mm. Those were maybe things I already did. Interesting. And so, yeah, so, I mean, it did, it did occur to me about a year ago, and I don't think I read it anywhere. I'm pretty sure it was just an outcome of base. I mean, when you start studying base, a lot of stuff falls out of that. And it's really interesting. I, I mean, I don't say I recommend studying base theory for everyone right away or at different times, but at different times in your life, I think I'll go back to base theory at some point. I mean, I, I went in deep enough to kind of get saturated with a certain perspective. The other big thing that emerged for me at that time is that it's all a binary. Mm. And the binarism of it is really funny. It's mm -hmm. really funny when you realize like it's all a binary, so there's another Mike, and there's another mm -hmm. Jonah, and there's another HDHD conference, mm -hmm. and there's another, like all of these things, there's part mm -hmm. of a binary. Mm -hmm. And it can get really funny. There's another Santa Fe, and there's another right. Ibiza, and so on. So each of these places has its double. And uh, maybe Richard Rudd might be the, the binary to Ra, I was talking uh, to Alok, and he said, who's my binary? And I said, probably Genoa, and he laughed, and, yeah, you know, that's and, then, um, but, and then, you know, Chaitanya versus Chaitanyo. Mm -hmm. For those of you in the Facebook human design world, you'll know Chaitanya FX as a meme lord, master human design analyst, and then for those who are a bit older in the HD, you'll know Chaitanyo of New Sun Services America out of Taos, New Mexico. Um, and you know, it's there. They also have a little bit of a binary. So, mm. so, um, but back to the 1949. So, regardless of whether you know this is like she has one hanging gate, it's her last, you know, her last emotional thing she has to work through before she gets to the completely undefined emotional, and then she gets, you know, I don't know how literal we could be with this. Like, Ra, for instance, said it was his last life. And he had a bunch of hanging mm -hmm. gates. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? He just ended halfway through? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, but that also does kind of make sense. I love that in human design, it's, it's not so neat and tidy. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there are potentials. You know, we have the potential to evolve to the 12-centered. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. The 12-centered won't get here because every life as we know it will be wiped out long before then. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the potentials... I love that the potentials are kind of built in and they're not always realized. Mm -hmm. Because if they were, they wouldn't be potentials. Right. So. <laughs> okay, so back to Depp and Heard. So he has the 1949 channel sensitivity, marriage bond, the needs of others, shelter, food, sex, love, loyalty. He compromises her only emotional gate, gate 49, uh, Dyfed writes. She only understands the emotional field through acceptance or rejection. Gate 49 is the bridegroom that says, obey my principles or you'll be rejected. So see, they both have it, but he's the one who ultimately decides, dominates. Yeah. Yeah, he ultimately decides. He ultimately dominates. He ultimately determines it. And she might not, not be able to accept that. That's what it always is. When you have half the channel, the other has the whole channel, it's really hard until you just surrender completely to their dominance. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's hard is because, and I've said this before, when you have a hanging gate that gate is invisible to you. It's right. just like when you have the whole channel, it's invisible to you. Yeah, yeah. You don't really see that in the other person. Now, there's a really nice compatibility there where you get less resistance there, at least when you have the whole channel. You know, I have 952 if I'm around somebody else who has 952. It's so nice, I don't even notice that they have it, mm -hmm. but there's just no resistance in that particular area because mm -hmm. we both are just kind of going along with the same thing there. Um, you have nine and I have the whole thing. Well, for you, you're not going to see my 9, per se. You're going to see my 52. And that's what's funny is, when you have half the channel, you only really see the hanging gate. So we were talking about our friend who has hanging 52. Mm -hmm. You put him next to me, and it's like that office meme. It's the same picture. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's a 52. Yeah, yeah. It's a 52. He's a 52. Jonah's a 52. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Except the difference is you can connect to his 50 right, right. and you can't connect to mine. Right, right, right. But it's an eternal mirage that lasts your entire life. Right. You can be married for 20 years, you wake up in the morning, you look at that person, they still look like they have the hanging gate. Yep. <laughs> this is why it becomes such a problem. It's not like you learn that you can't plug in and then you know it. You pretty much never learn. You just have to remind yourself you can't plug in right. and remind yourself to surrender and it's, right. just, it's, a, it's a tricky you thing. You can never see where you're surrendering to. Yeah, so she doesn't see his, right, she doesn't see his 49. She can't even see that he is the one who's choosing right. what the principles are right. or like determining the principles, what is, what is valid, what is not valid, what is uh, what gets you ousted and what doesn't, and so on. And he, she can't see that. All she sees is 19. So she sees him flirting. You know, 19 is like mammals. They flirt, they come up and shake their butt. You know, it's associated with that area. It's in the root. And, uh, you know, they come up and they flirt and say, I'll be your pet, you know, domesticate me. Mm-hmm. And then our human version of it is flirting and saying, you know, show me what resources you have, and then the 49 shows the resources, mm-hmm. and if they accept the 19's flirtation, say, okay, I'll take you as my pet. This is the ultimate sugar sugar oh, channel, yeah. you know, and okay, I'll take you as my pet, but never flirt with anyone else ever again. These are mm-hmm. the principles in this yeah, household, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, or we have other principles of radical honesty, and you're going to have to tell me this, you're going to have to do that, and you're going to have to, you know, there's, it's, it's, they're setting the principles. Mm-hmm. Well, she doesn't see that. She only sees the 19. So she sees Depp come up to her flirting, and then she sees herself as the one who chooses to accept him or mm-hmm. accepts or rejects mm-hmm. him. And if she accepts him, he can't flirt with anyone else and she determines the principles and so on. Mm-hmm. But it's not working. Over and over and over again, she's trying to plug into his 19. Right. His 19's already occupied. It's not right. available. You might try to plug into my 52. It doesn't work. I already, it's already being used. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is, the, this is the trick of compromise. So Dive In writes, they both have this gate, but it's emotional, so clarity emerges over time, and it's not always easy to see which relationships are wrong for us until they reach explosion, and sometimes not even then. The emotional wave system is always somewhere on the wave, moving between hope and pain and back again. And then she quotes Ra, this is where the violence is energized, this ratcheting wave of the tribal emotional system. It's there all the time, and most of the time the violence comes out of the undefined, because it's uncontrollable. We were talking about this yesterday, mm-hmm. about how it's the undefined who often gives voice to it, um, or gives expression to it, or, you know, I guess you can see that um, depending where the undefined, and what the undefined center is, you know, I have undefined throat, I have the 12, I often give voice to anger. Mm-hmm. There can be a tremendous anger in the 22 that's not expressed until it gets up to the 12. Mm-hmm. Or someone who has a 35 can give voice to the anger of the 36, or mm-hmm. can give voice to much else from it as well. So it's just interesting. So she is, you know, they're, they're both emotional. They both have 49, but she, because she's undefined and it's her 49 that's emotional. If her 19, it's her 49, you know, if she had the 19, it would be very different. And if she had this mm-hmm. undefined yeah, root, yeah. but it's, no, she has a defined root. She's not in a hurry for anything. Mm-hmm. It's that she's having this intense guillotine emotional reaction of mm-hmm. the cutting of the door slam. So, and then Ra says, oh yeah, so this is first dive in. Johnny's emotions set the tone in this relationship, and Amber's undefined solar plexus takes it in and amplifies it to distortion. And then a quote from Ra. You want to see violence? All you have to look at is the emotional system. It's there all the time, and most of the time the violence comes out of the undefined. Oh yeah, we already read that part. And uh, this is where the violence is energized. This ratcheting wave of the tribal emotional system, this building up and building up, and the snapping of it. It eventually snaps. Dive in continues. Within this tribal emotional stream, the wave pattern is one that can explode seemingly out of nowhere when needs aren't being met. Food, shelter, sex, loyalty, slash love, secure home, marriage, language, family, etc. The tribal emotional stream is also the stream of touch. It's, quote, all about physical hand contact. And that also means something else. Within it also lies the language of violence because the anger in a tactile world can always lead to physical violence. People get hit, children get hit, we talked about this yeah. yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and all of this is built into the stream. Okay, and here's actually where we stopped, was, was right at this point. Was uh, when the ratchet wave starts exploding, loyalty can turn to hatred, and it can be extremely hard to still the waves back to neutral. So that's where we stopped. So let's just talk a little about 1949. Um, I know a lot of people with this channel. It's interesting how many I, I get. I don't have anything there. So I get to really experience the 1949. You know, it's 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 really multifaceted. I mean, it's where it's the beginning of 
religion, it's the eating of meat, it's the domestication of animals, it's the fairness of who gets what cut of meat, it's the kitchen, it's the dinner table. It's your connectedness is a word that you have to do it, which is kind of not so obvious, but I guess that's where like the first religion came from. Interconnectedness, and is that why also the channel of synthesis is yeah, the yeah, yeah, term yeah. for right. interconnection? Good point. Yeah. Designing a sensitive being. It's, it's funny, funny though that the interconnectedness is on the root side. You think of the solar plexus side. But the 19 is what's yeah. Yeah, interconnected. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that. I mean, it's maybe it's the root fuel for connection in mm -hmm. that sense. Mm -hmm. Because it's mirror image on the 54 on the cold blooded side is cold ambition or you know it's it goes over it's the you know adrenalized spleen is going to be very cold and very like it's a little bit different than the warmth i mean when i hear interconnectedness it seems more like connection like mm -hmm. the first religion people come together mm -hmm. well and also so do you think touch is more on the emotional side or is touch or do you smell how i mean how does touch it is smell mm -hmm. more splenic because smell oh yeah Smell seems to relate to the spleen, and touch seems to relate. I mean, as far as Ajna binary, yeah. sorry, splenic binary has smell in it. Ajna has neither; it's all about vision. And then solar plexus binary has touch in it. Mm, so the solar plexus tribal channels have. I mean, they both have to do with touch. Obviously, right. with ambition, you're still shaking hands and so on. And mm -hmm. smell is also a part of it. But it and is then, interesting. Uh, the money, money line is kind, kind of both and either in a more even way. The 2145. There are more grounds there. there. They they don't, it doesn't, doesn't lean toward, I don't know if that's because they're both there in equal measure or whether neither of them are there, but you know what I mean? The money line doesn't, mm. doesn't prefer smell or touch. Yeah, it's interesting. I think of uh, money line, I think of like Don Corleone from The Godfather or something. Mm. And like, sure, he always, you know, kisses the cheek and pats on, mm. and, but then he also might say, I smell a rat. Yeah, you know, yeah I guess it is kind of a little presence of both. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I have another very sick funny question about those streams, about the tribal streams, and the fact that the, the, the solar plexus one terminates, terminates in the heart, right? right? Which is weird, because it's supposedly the spleenic one that actually continues into the mind line. Right, 40, reaches the, the 4426 goes up to 2145. Right. But then the 3740 is apparently doesn't feed that, that channel. So communism never makes it. Right. Well, well capitalism doesn't either, either because the money line is considered the channel of monarchy. So neither, neither of them really But capitalism feeds into monarchy exactly, and exactly, yeah, yeah, doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but you, you know, know what communism and interconnectedness and all that does feed into is the mystical way, right? right? So, so they, they do get to terminate at the throat through that other weird, weird arcane circuit. Where so the 3740 changes. leaves the tribal behind, exactly. goes into the 5125, and then goes to the 1020. Right. Yeah. That is funny, that and they both make it to the throat in different ways. And I do suspect that the actual instantiation of the revolution is an, like an inner life thing. That, that what a revolution actually looks like is like this inner psychic process thing. And that occasionally you can see flowering or expressions of that in the external world, but that is... But the ultimate the effect, the throat manifestation of it is through this individual channel that is really only realized in the individual. Yeah, I'm just going to move this here. I realize this is pointing at me, and if it picks up both, we sometimes get this really rude. Okay. This is where it picks up. Oh, it doesn't this go is over. Cool. Well, well, it was just awesome. pointing at me, and well, I, I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I noticed yeah. that they were. It's, it's totally fine. I'm sure it'll be cool. fine. But I remember once I had two microphones, and they had made this weird, like, chorus effect. It wasn't, it wasn't the worst, but. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so, but this is an interesting point. So, the tribal. And so communism, and so you're saying that communism prepares you for the inner revolution of the 5125. It's like communism only takes you so far. This is something that I think would be really good for Marxists and people who are kind of in critical theory and various, like I wish I could have had this information years ago when I was really deep in critical theory and post-structuralist philosophy because I see what you're saying. It's that, you know, Zizek, who I absolutely love, or like Jody Dean or any of these like, big Marxist philosophers. I and mean, I think Zizek is probably the biggest living Marxist philosopher mm -hmm. and the most famous and so on. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. And um, what he's saying is, you know, we have to change the world. But what we're finding is that the 3740 is ultimately just about being part of something bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And that's where it ends. And there's yeah. nowhere to go after that. You yeah. get to be part of something bigger than you. But then once you reach the aloneness, in your aloneness, a very few people 
will have the courage, 51, to leave the tribe behind, right. to jump into the unknown, and if they're lucky, find a priestess, 25, mm -hmm. or a priest who initiates them into mm -hmm. the path of the self, where they discover self-love, mm -hmm. gate 10, and then get to the awakening of the 1020, and mm -hmm. the presence in the now. And well, and didn't you say that life can initiate you? So if you, if you, I mean, First of all, an object can carry the half of the gate, that, half of the channel that initiates you. Oh, that's right? a great point, because inanimate objects have 25. Right. That's amazing to me. So if you have something hanging there, or maybe that hanging gate's activated by a transit, you're around the right object, you have the full, you have the borrowed full channel, which could initiate you, right? From you that's a, yeah, your... that's a good point. It doesn't. It's not dependent on a person. It is just the initiation that you go through from leaving the tribe behind and going through your own kind of dark night of the soul. I would often put the Dark Knight of the Soul, so this is interesting because Teo Montoya puts the hero's journey as the mystic way, and I always put the hero's journey as the experiential way, mm -hmm. and they're different streams. Serious. But you can see a little parallel with the Gate 36 being the darkening of the light, mm -hmm. kind of the end of Act 2 in a story, and like mm -hmm. the hero looks like they've lost out, and they have their Dark Knight of the Soul, mm -hmm. where it appears the forces of evil have won. Right. That's the theme of Gate 36. They call it the darkening of the light because it's the moment where it appears that the forces of light have lost for good. Mm -hmm. It's the Death Star blowing up the planet. Right, it's right. the Batman and Batman 3 falling into the pit and breaking his back after right, his right. fight with Bane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's basically the darkening, the darkest time. And yet there's also a corollary to that with the leaving behind of the tribe of the 51 and its own perilous journey or its journey through Chapel Perilous or, you know, so there are corollaries there, and it's mm -hmm. interesting that there's the human experiential way, and then there's the mystical way, and they're both sort of hero's journeys, mm -hmm. but maybe a different kind of hero's journey. Right. Maybe the experiential way is more like the road trip, and the mystical way is the one that's a little more... I mean, it'd be interesting to see if certain hero's journeys stop at certain places, even, mm -hmm. you know? like. What I liked what, that Ra did in his uh, you know, analysis of mystics, uh, which is in the Rave Cosmology materials, is that he looked at the charts of 200 mystics throughout history. Now, of course, before 1781, we don't have a nine-centered chart, right. but you can still see what gates were activated, essentially. Mm -hmm. And since then, of course, we, we do have the nine-centered chart. And he just found that virtually every mystic had a channel, not even a gate. He said, mm -hmm. if you don't have a channel in that, you're probably not a mystic. Mm. It's funny because Alok said, I'm so mystical. He goes, you're a true mystic. And I said, well, I don't have a channel in mystical ways. He said, well, your personality earth is gate 25. Mm. So you're, you're definitely, you know, you have, it has something to do with you at least. Mm. Um, so, and I think there's no hard, fast rules in this way. Because as you said, I can temporarily have a 51 or I can mm. need another 51 and they can. But I've seen how people who carry that 2551 are kind of walking embodiments of initiation. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's an interesting one too, but yeah, a really interesting point about how capitalism ultimately leads to monarchy, communism ultimately leads to nowhere except really the tribe coming together, mm -hmm. but then certain people can leave behind and then they can take what they've learned from the communism. So it does lead somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's just, you have to like abandon and leave the tribe behind right. to do it. Um, but what's interesting also is that, you know, when you really zoom in on these gates, like I wouldn't be surprised to discover that some heroes' journeys are just nineteen to forty-nine. Mm -hmm. Almost every channel is its own hero's oh, journey. Yeah. You amazing. know, yeah. you like the the and, and different stories. Like I love how a story like Deadwood, for instance, the HBO show, can be about the founding of civilization in the West and mm -hmm. about you know, or The Wire can be about the functioning of like certain shows have these overarching themes. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if the entire show is really just the problem of how do we get from this gate to that gate across uh, the yeah, channel. True, you yeah. have six seasons to zoom in on like people trying all the various mm -hmm. ways to get from the 19 to the 49 or to get right. from the 37 to the 40 wow. or, or whatever yeah, right, it is. Yeah. Just like negotiating this one particular channel. Because oftentimes we just want more and we're like, show me how this story is told through all of these gates. Mm -hmm. But instead, you can also show how a story can be told through two gates, you know, or something, right? There's a certain certain gates. I mean, the entire story of the hero's journey can be the 51 to the 25 for one film, mm -hmm. because that can be a coming-of-age story about leaving behind oh, yeah, the family yeah. of origin and setting out on your own and finding yourself. Right, right. What is that if not 51, 25, mm -hmm. right? Or, yeah, yeah. So, or another one can be the 10 to the 20, someone who you know, has really found themselves, but they, it's the story of their awakening, or however you want to, however you want to look at or it. Or a guy who so becomes a fly, you know, strange <laughs> machine. That's, that's <laughs> a real 10-20 story right there. 
<laughs> becoming the <laughs> I'm, the, uh, I'm the insect. Yeah, becoming insect. Very Delusian. Very Kafka esque. Okay. Well, let's look at. So we'll, we'll continue with dive ins. Uh, you know, excellent in depth. Um, look here at Heard and Depp, and she says, let's look at their electromagnetic, their other electromagnetic centers. Amber's wide open G is looking for a sense of identity, direction, and love. Let's just look at their charts again really quick, because it kind of helps. Oh yeah, so Heard does have a wide open G, completely undefined. She does have three gates pointing at it, but this is a pretty open, that's the openness right there. That's, open. that's an open G. And then when we go to, to Johnny Depp, he has the 1-8, as we, as we saw before. Do they, they both have zero, zero integration? integration? Oh, good question. Yeah, Johnny Depp definitely has zero integration, and so, so does Amber Heard. Weird. Good, good observation. Yeah, yeah that's that doesn't fair. have any integration, which... Because that's rare, right? It's, it, it's is more common, it is more common to have at least one hanging gate, because if it's around 30% chance, and you have four chances to have a hanging gate, right. more times than not, out of four chances, a 30% chance, you're gonna have at least one mm -hmm. happen more times than not. It's not like super rare to have nothing there, but it's decently rare. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so she has a wide open G looking for a sense of identity, direction, and love. No sense of it on her own. She is defined by her environment and by the people in her life. Johnny has a fixed sense of identity via his channel 1-8. This is the unique creative individual. He's both the artist and the agent. He doesn't need another person to carry out that expression consistently. The one is considered the artist and the eight is the agent. And there can be problems when the agent wants their own creative expression, their own creativity, or when the artist isn't happy with how they're being presented. Or, um, this channel compromises Amber's conscious Venus. Ah, so she has the eight. So while she likes to be the one to have the spotlight for her unique creative contributions, she is outshined in this relationship and may feel her creative voice goes unheard. Mm. That's a good point. And this yeah. is actually something that Cohen Hillowart talks about when you have circuitry in relationships and how difficult it is, particularly with compromises in that. You know, he talks more just about how circuitry is important, where someone with an individual channel can really not, like you have individual channels, you have two. Mm -hmm. You might not feel heard, or it might be really important for you that the other person listens to what you have to say, and the complaint might be acoustic, basically. Mm -hmm. They use yeah, a negative yeah. tone of voice mm -hmm. to me, they're not oh, really yeah. listening to oh, me. Yeah. These are the kind mm -hmm. of, and then for me, being really collective, it's more about how does it look? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, how does it look? I'm so embarrassed, oh, or my reputation's yeah, at stake. Don't, you know, don't, don't come across this way, oh, or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but, that is an interesting side of it. Um, and Herd only has tribal and individual. Uh, she has two individual and two tribal. And then Depp has tribal and tribal and individual. So neither of them care how it looks. Wow. <laughs> this is what happens when people lack collective circuitry. They don't think about how it looks to the public. They don't make one together? Oh, maybe they do. They, maybe they do. That's well. I'm sure we'll get to that, and they, and they very well might, because you know there's more chance of having electromagnetic. It would be funny if they didn't. Let's find out. Well, let's let's find out. I'm keep going. Okay. So, dive in continues um, that Dev has a consciously defined ego via the 2145. This is the tribal leader, the boss. There is ego, willpower, and control in this channel. With the defined ego, his consistent willpower to be able to keep promises and commitments and to, quote, make things happen. Oh, with the defined ego, he has consistent willpower. The problem with having a defined will slash ego with unconscious solar plexus authority is that he needs to learn to wait for emotional clarity when mm -hmm. making decisions and not implement his willpower when emotionally charged. The 25, the, he has the, the 21.5, the fifth line of gate 21. The 21.5 especially, since they're here to be in control, but we need our 21.5s to be emotionally stable. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. With Johnny, Amber's undefined ego is under pressure to prove her worth, but she has inconsistent willpower. This may lead her to make commitments and promises she cannot keep, ultimately letting herself and Johnny down. There may be a battle of the wills here as he fixes her ego with his dominant 21.45 and she amplifies it. Mm. Well, that's rough, and the 21.45, as an electromagnetic, is considered 
one of the three hardest electromagnetics in the whole chart. Right. Uh, do you know the other two? Um, channel of struggle? Nope. Damn, I don't know. <laughs> the 515. Oh, yeah. The yeah, fixed yeah. rhythms remember. versus yeah. the extremes. Right, right. And the 3536, interestingly. Oh, that was an interesting okay. one to yeah. me. The experience yeah, versus inexperience. Right. Or, you know. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, but those are just kind of, those are interesting ones. I mean, I'm sure they're all difficult in their own way. And then 2838 as a compromise can be very hard, which we yeah. have. I have 28 and you have the whole thing. And that can be very hard. Ra talks about how compromises on love gates mm. are just about the second hardest thing oh, yeah. in a chart. The hardest is compromise on love gate that's also a split. Oof. <laughs> you know, that's their bridging gate. Yeah. And, the, the, uh, and they have the hanging gate and they're looking for the other oh, end and then no. the other person has the whole channel. That is the hardest of the hard. Well, that sounds difficult. But even just, you know, my 28 trying to plug into your 38, mm. because it's a love gate, it can, it can turn to hatred. It's the mm. love of purpose. And then when I try to enlist your root energy to find my purpose, and I can't, because mm. it's already busy finding your purpose, right, right. I can, you know, that can be difficult as well. Okay, so Divin continues that she will touch on Hurd's bizarre behavior of, ahem, pooping in Depp's bed. What's, have you heard yeah, about this? I think you mentioned it yesterday. I hadn't heard I that. think it was vengeful. When I first heard it, I thought it was incontinence or accidental, uh -huh. but then someone explained, no, it was like a vengeance thing. That's like so it was strange, vengeance. yeah. Like, I mean, very territorial. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, what stands out to me, Divin says, is Herd's 58.2. This line is called perversion, and it can be about being willing to give her energy to anything, no matter how bizarre, in challenge of authority. Uh -huh. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I have 58.1, and I know that one. I mean, that's one of my favorites. And I remember thinking, like, oh, I dodged a bullet. I don't have 58.2. But, um, and then, you know, Ra talks about 58.2 and the line companions, and people always freak out when they see this one, but maybe they're... The perversion is just, it's almost this extreme. Like, I, I knew a guy, my girlfriend at the time up in Seattle, this was years and years ago, had a friend from Vancouver who worked on the X-Files. Mm. And this guy must have had perversion because he wasn't like a sex pervert, but almost. Like, mm. he was really into horror movies with gore and he like worked on like prosthetics for like popping zits and stuff. Oh. And one of the films he made was like a person, like a woman in a bathtub full of cheese Whiz. Ugh. I mean, this is perverted, yeah, okay? True. This is like, what is going on here? Let's just read it a little bit. Line two, perversion. Wow, when I looked it up, they only have the detriment. Does this mean that there is no <laughs> exaltation? Or maybe it's because the sun was in it. Maybe the sun is the detriment. A genius for perverse stimulation that afflicts oneself and others by promoting degeneracy wow. and reducing joy to indulgence and decadence. Damn. The energy which fuels the drive for perverse stimulation. So that's, that's just from a quick Google search. That very well may be, um, there may actually be an exalt. It may just be that it's because that was for the sun. Mm. So I'm just going to quickly um, open up my Rave E. Ching. And uh, here we see, oh yeah, it does. It says no exaltation, no polarity. Mm. So that is literally, there is no polarity. So it's not really a detriment. They listed it as a detriment. But it's not, it's neither. It's just, yeah. there's no polarity. They it's, just decided it was They just decided it was a detriment. They're like, we're just, we, we have to put it as either excellent or detriment. That's a detriment. Yeah. <laughs> there's no polarity. The energy which fuels the drive for perverse stimulation. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I get where she's going with that. So. Yeah, that was a great find. That's super. And, that. but, but, um. Dive in says, so it can be about being willing to give energy to anything, no matter how bizarre and challenge of authority. We've made perversion out to be a dirty word. This isn't always about dirty things, just unusual things. Mm. Her 1858 channel of judgment that, that Amber Heard has. Uh, the fuel and pressure to find faults and make corrections. This can be a great energy for businesses and making corrections within systems, but this energy can come across as nitpicky and criticizing when not invited to share. Oh yeah. Yeah, well we know about that. I remember, um, I think it was, uh, well, okay, I, I, I can't go back to too much of that memory, but I've had, 1858 was one of the, it's nice when you're learning human design, you learn certain examples. I've already shared most of them on my YouTube, but I thought of one that I hadn't shared. It was just, 
it, it was just going back, it's just a little bit personal, but it was a, a friend of mine whose partner at 1858, like we were talking about it, you can give people so much relief when you go, well, and by the way, that person is 1858, they go, you know, what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. well, it's kind of perfectionistic, yeah. you know, there's the right way to do things, it's like, it could always be better, and yeah. he's like, really, tell me more, and you tell more and more and more, and he's like, oh my God, you just explained the last 10 years of my life, right, I right. thought, I thought she was just this way, and yeah. actually this is, you know, you start to see it in a very different way. Um, so, and then Divin says, she guesses that Herd's 18 is in line five. I'm gonna actually skip over this. I realized you should, you know, anyone who's enjoying this, just read the whole thing. I'm gonna kind of skip around a little bit now because we're kind of getting through it, but just read the, read the whole thing that Divin wrote because it's amazing. And I don't want to read the whole thing here because I want people to go find her work and go read it on their own right. too, so. But I will just, um, I'll just kind of go through some of the highlights here. Um, and thank you so much, Di, for all this amazing analysis and um, just all of your analysis. I mean, Diana is a really incredible analyst and everything she posts is great, so. Okay, Heard has the 2838 channel struggle. Well, you have this as well. Di Van writes, this is a deaf channel, deaf to external influence. The 2838 is about the struggle and the fight for individual purpose and meaning of life. There can be stubbornness and intensity here especially because she has gate 28 four times, including her Pluto in 28.6, the blaze of glory. Wow, that's an interesting one. Blaze of glory, I mean, I know a personality son on blaze of glory. Mm -hmm. I like what Martin Grassinger said about it in his Human Design Collective podcast, where he's like, you read about it and it looks suicidal, but I know 28.6 is and they're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to sugarcoat it, but at the same time, you don't want to give an overly negative view. Right. Blaze of glory doesn't sound great. Yeah. She could be going out in a blaze of glory here in this yeah, whole public exactly. thing. That's what it makes me think of. It's like, I'm going to take you down with me. Right. Kind of, we're going to take each other down. So, You know, you see a lot more, you see a ton of suicidal ideation in people with the whole channel, but I think you see more suicide attempts in people that only have half of it. Interesting. Interesting. I remember also that Ra said there's a lot of suicidal ideation in the 2343, but that they're the ones who call the hotlines. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes which, sense. by the way, the trigger warning. We've only talked about this stuff. Yeah. We're supposed to talk about trigger. I mean, right. and um, yeah, if you're here, I, you're supposed to do this. I'll just, I'll just do this really quick. You're just supposed to. Anytime you talk about this stuff, because people find yeah, it. Not, yeah, because yeah, you find it. Um, you know, and I'm just going to say. Prevention, there we go. Nice. And that's the hotline. Oops, and I'll just put that up because we're talking about it. Oh my god. Whoa. <laughs> First you must solve this riddle. <laughs> First you must, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you or anyone you know is experiencing any, you know, ideational thoughts of this kind of stuff, then just give them a call. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a 4323 to call. You don't have to be a. Uh, 2838, anyone, anyone can call. So, um, but yeah, so Blaze of Glory, uh, Divan writes, Gate 28 is in Scorpio and it's opposite her son. Pluto opposite sun in the natal chart, it, you know, it is, is definitely self-destructive, self-sabotage, mm -hmm. and so on. Though 28 is exalted by Pluto, her 38-3 in detriment pulls her entire channel of struggle into detriment. Her 38.3 is about building potential alliances in a fight, but only against a co common enemy. Mm. Selfish alliance, which saps the energy of one's partners in order to ensure personal vitality. And she compromises Depth's 38.5 here, the ambition to stubbornly fight alone. Okay. So he's stubbornly fighting alone, and she's making selfish alliances. Oof. She pulls him into her struggles and her fights, and his struggles are left unheard. Because mm. remember, he has that mm. undefined... Spleen, he only has 38. That's an interesting one. So maybe you you pull me into your struggles, but I don't, you know, my struggles are kind of like, my struggle for purpose is like, well, John has to find his own 38 to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I see. Her 2750 has the potential to be deeply caring and altruistic, or the opposite, selfish and greedy. 27 in line one is selfishness. The shadow of this can be expecting others to take care of her. She also has 27 in line three insatiability, the drive to have more than one needs, sexually, mentally, or materially. The shadow of this is the lust for power and the greed that always wants more than one needs. Hmm. Gate 50 in line 4 knows which rules can be bent. The shadow side of this is corruption. She has the 360, the chaos and confusion. She can trigger chaos as well as order. 
um, mutative potential here, but it's not always on. And there can be a melancholy when there's nothing happening. Um, and then a quote from Ra. 360s can be very powerful at changing the way in which the collective functions because they do that with the presence of that format. You know how they do it? I'll tell you a secret, Ra says. They depress the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true. That's how they change the collection, the collective, is just by depressing them, by being really depressed, by making nice. it. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm going to save that one in my own little post it. I just saved that one for a clip for later. That's great. Perhaps another reason Def was holding on, he's a split definition. He's wired for partnership. The basic split definition, definition feels a sense of wholeness by being in a relationship and will be the one who wants to hang on and fix a relationship. Mm. As a basic split, he feels like something is missing within himself in order to feel complete and will be unconsciously drawn to people who bridge his split. In his case, he's drawn to people who have gate 12, 35, or 37. Mm. So, I, I bridge your split, Johnny. <laughs> okay, so these are what he looks for in a partner, but also what he tries to embody within himself in order to feel whole. whole. So, his 22 design son wants someone or something worth listening to. Yeah, he's looking for the 12. As 35, he's looking for the new experiences, for the growth and wisdom. As 37, it's the pressure for affection and loyalty. And I, I would add fear of fear of tradition, fear of standing up to tradition, mm -hmm. fear of not getting the affection if you stand up to so the 37. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that 3740 is just about the tribal tradition. Right, it can right. be as a nervousness. It can be like, well, I can't tell them that I don't want to go to the, you know, Christmas because they'll be hurt. Oh, yeah. Then I won't get the affection I want. Amber won't mirror Johnny's need for another person to feel whole. She has a single definition. She also doesn't bridge his split, leaving him feeling as though something is missing. That's so interesting. So that's why he's not hooked on her. He's not trying everything to stay, to stick around. I mean, split deaf's greatest fear is they're going to break up, and I always tell them, well, be careful what you wish for, because you're not going to. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's actually worse to stay with right, somebody right. through thick and thin, even when you shouldn't be together. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't bridge his split, so he's going to feel something's missing, and as Divin writes, also leaving his emotional energy stuck in the body, unable to reach the throat for expression, and his emotions unable to be integrated with his identity, ego, and voice. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing Ross says is when you have people who have relationships that have splits in them still, um, you know, they usually met during a transit that bridged that split. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go back to when they first met, probably 12 or 35 or 37 were in the transits. Mm -hmm. And um, Divin continues, Amber as a generator probably had a different idea about how, how life would be with Johnny Depp. It could come as a shock to generators and projectors to actually meet the closed and repelling manifestor aura. Other auras contract in his presence, and Amber's open and enveloping aura is unable to truly envelop him, and his aura will not envelop hers, leaving her feeling like she can't get in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always weird when you actually do meet somebody, especially manifestors try so hard to be like, I'm a nice manifestor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I tell you when I'm leaving the room. I say bye before leaving. Mm -hmm. I don't just Irish goodbye. Look at me. I inform you of all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And then you meet them, and they're just like, cold as ice, brick wall. And you know what it really feels like? What, and I'm not trying to knock manifestors here, um, although not many of them are into human design. No, sorry, I, I love my manifestors. I gotta be careful here. And you know, I've also, there's so many stereotypes and once you actually meet them, you go, oh my God, this is like meeting an awake manifestor and a sleep manifestor is like worlds apart. Like, it, you know, I mean, an awake manifestor can have you in tears through their beautiful impact, mm -hmm. through their ability to just break through your, everything you have and just nail it because, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of have x-ray vision into you, you don't have x-ray vision into them. Mm -hmm. Not projector x-ray vision, but it's still, you know, generators wear their emotions on their sleeve, mm -hmm. they wear their feelings on their sleeve, and the manifestor has access to it. It's others that have a hard time with them. But I just, I do think back to when Ra said he, he lectured to a room full of manifestors and he would never do it again mm -hmm. because he said it felt completely repressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't describe it this way, but I almost imagine the manifestor as like the Victorian England ideal. Like, remember, before 1781, there were no projectors. Right. So before 1781, it was 90% generators. Right. All those projectors were not manifestors. They were generators. Right. So 90% generators, and then we have 9% or whatever manifestors and 1% reflectors. Is that really how it worked, though? Oh, yeah. Distribution? Wow. Oh, yeah. It was wow. still the same small percentage of manifestors. Wow. 
And the, there were no more manifestors. I mean, Ra talked about how manifestors were always like one tenth of the population because yeah. it was just basically a super ton of generators. That's what you needed, yeah. And that's what you needed to get the world built in this tiny little group. I mean, this might not be word for word from Ra because he was always really wishy washy about the seventh center and said, if you want to learn about it, study Ayurveda or study, you know, he was always kind of like, if you want to look at the pre 1781, you're going to have to look at a different system because right, there's. Right. So he may not have unequivocally stated this. But it sure seems that way from the way he described it and how few manifestors there were. Mm -hmm. But what's funny is when you see the manifestors, like the good life and how the people in charge have always lived, and uh, it's always super informal. Oh, yeah, right. It's informal, always super yeah, formal. Right. I mean, this is core to Zizek, core to Lacan, is that the master, mm -hmm. in the discourse of the master, gives up their enjoyment oh. and everyone else, the slaves and the workers and the employees and everybody else gets to truly enjoy because even though they're working their ass off, mm -hmm. then they get to laugh and tell their stories and tell mm -hmm. their jokes mm -hmm. and they get to all have a communal thing that mm -hmm. the master never gets because the master has to maintain the air of formality. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Weird. this sound like yeah, manifestor versus yeah. generators? Mm -hmm. So the whole world we've created of the wealthy and the formality and all of it is super repressed. Mm -hmm. It's sexually repressed. It's emotionally repressed. I mean, manifestors are the most repressed people. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I've had manifestors break down and cry in front of me and it's been like amazing, but it's also been like generators can do that anytime because we're so open. We mm -hmm. can just access that anytime. Yeah. And I've had manifestors tell me that they've had the deepest connection to someone by staring deeply, like see for instance, like staring deeply into their eyes for mm -hmm. hours on end and having, or like having the most passionate love making or having the most intense experiences. And I'm like, I get that from sitting next to somebody on a park bench. Yeah, yeah. You know, my yeah. aura gets to that same level of openness and realness mm -hmm. and unrepressedness. Mm -hmm. So the repression is real for manifestors. People don't talk about this keynote of manifestors. They say, oh, I have an amazing manifestor partner. Well, yeah, but are they super, super repressed and you're mm -hmm. constantly working with them on a daily basis to get them to actually open up about things? And, mm -hmm. you know, because. The manifestor is not really designed for that even. And I guess it actually raises the question of how correct it is. But it seems like that's what they want more than anything is human connection. Mm -hmm. That deep human connection that generators have automatically that the manifestor needs really intense eye contact mm -hmm. or really intense peak experiences or something to break through. Right. You know, they're trying to break through so they can have that connection that we get for free. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just a little side note. I'm not trying to knock any of my, my manifestors out here, but just a good point from Divin about how, you know, in this relationship, any relationship with a manifestor, you can't really get in. And Divin writes, she can see how a lot of pent up anger and bitterness could completely consume these two in a relationship like this. And then she puts a disclaimer, this analysis is not to direct blame at either Amber nor Johnny. She writes that she believes the toxicity and abuse goes both ways and they simply brought out the worst in each other. That's what she sees in the mechanics. So. In any case, we'll turn this one off. Uh, make sure to check out, if you're interested in reading the whole thing, check out Divin's work, check out her Instagram, check out her work on Facebook, on the uh, Human Design Catalyst, and on Human Design and Astrology at some of the other sites. She's on a bunch of them. She's on relationship ones. And mm -hmm. She's all over the Human Design Facebooks. And check out, her, um, if you want to book a reading with her, she is booked up for a few weeks, but you can get in the queue on Calendly. So... And that's Diana Elevin. All right, I'm going to put this one back on. Um, so we've already been going for almost an hour. So wow. we, we might not, and we really took up a lot of time. That's oh, okay. Johnny Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. That's, yeah. you know, I have a few That's what's answers. going on in human design is this court case. It is going on. I mean, it's yeah. going on in the world. People are pretty into it. Sure. Okay, I have something fun. I'm going to keep reading from this in a moment, but I do want to open up. One of the first, we're going to do a little unboxing. I want to do more of these. I'm not going to do them all today, but I want to do a little unboxing of one of the newest additions to the Santa Fe Human Design Library. Oh. And this also gives me an opportunity to announce it. I already did a soft announce in the Human Design Catalyst group, but I'm starting, we're starting really. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I say starting, I'm building. I'm building something waiting for the projectors and the manifestors to help me really initiate it. Right. So I'm in the collecting phase yeah. and the building phase and the gathering. Right. I, have, I have the concentration channel. Mm -hmm. It's about concentrating things together. And, you know, I, I'm kind of just gathering these things together and so on. And, um, and so what I've been doing is I've been trying to collect as much as I can for human design materials. And in fact, I, I will just, I'll give a little sneak preview, you know. 
So these are some of them. Uh, some of the cool books I have here. and You know, we'll, we'll go into these more later, but what I wanted to do was a little unboxing, and I'm going to do a whole series of these. Uh, I found this incredible collection of human design CDs. Do you mind if I grab a water? Not at all. Go ahead. Um, no, well, yeah, just, just fill, fill up this one. Okay. Great. Okay, so I think just wait a moment, and I'm going to, I'll just add, um, um, All right, so here is in the newest acquisition. I'm gonna wait for Mike to get back. And I got this from Sedona, Arizona. Now what's interesting is a couple months ago, I saw a huge collection of like 100 human design CDs. I haven't opened them yet. I'm gonna do an unboxing on that separately. Uh, but then I bought those, you know, not cheap, it's $40, I don't even know. And then, uh, oh, excellent, better. Um, and so then I ended up having a bird set and the guy posts more, and I buy like another 50 CDs. And then he posts more, and I'm like, hey, could you just give me a little discount and just sell me the rest of your CDs at once? So he like posts a random like 14 or 15 CDs, and he did give me a little discount. I bought the rest of them. And then like two weeks later, this one CD ends up. So I guess he like found this in the back closet. You know, yeah. it was like one that he'd forgotten to do. And I'm pretty sure it's from a hospice thrift. I'm not entirely sure, but I looked at the other listings, and I think it said something about Sedona Hospice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I am, we're both color three. I mean, friends of the ghosts, you know? Mm. So where are the ghosts? Well, I don't know. I just have always had connections to ghosts, and I've always had connections to uh, thrift stores and to hospice. You know, hospice is obviously oh, care yeah, for people yeah. who are dying. And I'm not exactly sure where these came from. If anyone has information on these, but here's the unboxing. I just opened it up. And uh, da, 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 another one. Here, why don't you open this one? <laughs> We'll see what we got. And we'll do more unboxings later, but I just wanted to kind of do one, um, and over time we'll be doing more. The four types. This must be about variable. <laughs> I don't know. I think this is actually, this is all earlier. Cool. Variable didn't come out until later. I think this is literally before manifesting generators. Look, manifester, generator, projector, reflector. There Designed is, right. and <laughs> The four <laughs> types, <laughs> not five. Yeah, your <laughs> latest meme. Everyone check out High Desert Human Design on Instagram, and Mike has a meme about it. Don't make me push the button. But um, yeah, so this is designed and produced by Ra Uruhu. He really was a designer, too. He loved graphical stuff, you know, being able to... Yeah, it's crazy how futuristic the like um, Jovian archive texts look, and like their weird kind of like one two K design. Um, yeah, great font, very cool. It's got the oh, it's okay. We can get another case. It's got the um, the heads from those old from the old uh, photographs. I mean, yeah, oops, a little bit of that. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Just move it a little bit. Um, Let's see what it has. Nothing reveals better the truth and simplicity of human design than type. To follow the strategy of one's type is to be transformed. Cool. The Living Design Series. Nice. The Living Design Series. I wonder who folded this. You wonder who folded it. <laughs> someone, someone folded this. Okay, this is a CDR. Okay, there's a guy at the coffee shop. Someone, uh, someone folded this CDR. And yeah, yeah, right. The coffee shop person. I don't know. I mean, Rob might have put someone to work. Maybe this is the... Yeah, it says... So this is Jovian Archive. So this one's not a new Sun Services. So this one probably is still available through Jovian. I've been getting... Most of the CDs I've been getting are from New Sun Services America, mm -hmm. NSSA, which I'd like to do a whole video just on that and on that history because Jan von, von Denberg, who we talked about in the last one, as being kind of the MVP, he did a whole research on where those ended up. Mm. The cassettes and the CDs and so on. And, mm. But in any case, all right, so we have a new edition for the Santa Fe Human Design Library. And, you know, our goal is basically for digital or for stuff like this, we'll make a digital copy, but we're not going to make that available because of copyright reasons. Mm -hmm. But when people are in town, they can borrow this and listen to it. And we're also going to have books available that they can borrow. And they will be documented and put online. You're not going to be able to download or read them online. Eventually, I would love to have PDFs available and, and so on, but we need permission for those. But as far as having a physical location to store the physical information, 
and have photos and a catalog and everything online. And then when people come to Santa Fe, either just to visit throughout the year or they're coming from a conference, uh, they can check out the Santa Fe Human Design Library and they can get stuff like the four types, Ra Uruhu. So, nice. And you know, there's a lot of other books. I have some others, uh, just as an example, you know, understanding human design types and so on. Um, there will also be merch. You know, this was merch from last last conference. These are the um, the Bond Two plates here. This is Ra sitting on a Biza, and these are kind of like just interesting merch. Um, we're obviously going to put a copy of the schedule and guidebook from Human Design 2021, and in each year, you know, we're yeah. going to have anyone this year. Uh, for those who don't know, this is July 27th to 31st in Santa Fe, and um, it's a pretty fun, pretty fun guidebook. Those that were here got to got a good kick out of it. Um, just kind of, kind of a silly one, and yeah, it'd be nice. So, um, but in any case. And then, uh, oh yeah, I have a few others here, just a couple other books. I've been, hey, you know, we're, we're just collecting everything relevant to human design. Mm -hmm. um, oh, let's see, just a couple others really quick. And I want to also include books that are not human design specific, but like books on the planets. Mm -hmm. So I can have a whole astronomy section, books on neutrinos, you know, and I'm going to have books on incarnation sequencing, mm -hmm. where we talk about cards of destiny, or we have books on cards of destiny. And, I mean, this is my idea. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as a generator, I just collect this stuff, and then I, I have Mike or I have other, other people help me figure out what it should be and how it should work and so on. Um, but I'm just collecting them. So a whole bunch of books came out. Just the library of true stuff. <laughs> just the library of true stuff, exactly. Karen Curry Parker must have done like a book group or something because she had like all these students all publish books at the same time with forwards by her. But I mean, I'm, I'm into it. That's great. Yeah. I mean, the more the merrier. You know, we need, we need people studying yeah. this stuff. I just like that she wrote forwards to all of them. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have these from Esther. Esther Patrizia did this great, um, these great cards. And Oh, and so I should mention, uh, uh, yeah, if you do, <laughs> this is one of my favorites, sorry. One of my favorites for the collection. So, oh, yeah, classic. just so good, oh, so good. I know you were borrowing this for a while, listening to it. And, yeah, and then like at the uh, at the last uh, conference, we just had this playing on loop on the porch, and that was fun. And so I should just take this opportunity to mention, if anybody wants to donate materials to the Santa Fe Human Design Library, the SFHDL, eventually we'll have a website, sfhdl.org, where you can um, have your name as a donor, if you want, or you can be anonymous. And just get a hold of me, uh, jdempsey at gmail.com or um, through Facebook or Instagram, and I can give you my address where you can mail uh, your donation, or I can even send postage, and, you know, stuff like that. So, okay, well, it's, we're already at an hour. We'll just do a little bit more here. Um, I'd like to hear, yeah, some of your comments on things. So I'm just going to go through them, and we can just kind of go next go. if they're not. Okay. Lightning round. Lightning round. And then I have a... A couple more announcements real quick. The lady round. Okay. Tone three as the source of the not self. Oh yeah. Where did that come from? That Possibly. was something that was something that Dominant said she read up from James Alexander. Yeah, I think so. Mm. But just if you have any special connection of tone three mm. action to the not self. My only thought of that is just the Ajna binary. And yeah. maybe it's just very thinking oriented. It's also kind of the pinnacle of the left variable process. Yeah. So when I think tone three, I think Napoleon. Mm. And so maybe like, maybe all of our not selves are kind of these Napoleonic petty tyrants. Mm. And so that's exemplified by tone three. That's about as far as I can go with it. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay, we're in lightning round, so we can keep going. Triple split and information processing. Oh yeah, this was one comment for me to have. So people always ask about the difference in triple splits and splits and all this stuff. And triple splits and single, you know, your triple split, I'm single deaf. What I just say is triple splits take a long time to learn. Oh, yeah. A lot longer, and there's nothing bad about it. You learn it more completely in, in deeper ways and in more, more multifaceted ways. Mm. But it's just, it's more about the timing. Like someone's like, well, what would a triple split do in this situation? Well, would a triple split say yes to this kind of job? Would a triple split want to be in that kind of relationship? I can never yeah. answer those questions. Yeah, that All I, well, I'm just saying, you know, people try to, to try to reverse engineer it. Right? Nice. Like, and then, I mean, some of it you can. You can be like, oh, a single deaf and they only have integration circuitry, and they've been like a forest ranger living oh, yeah. alone mm -hmm. by themselves in the middle of nowhere. Right. Yeah. Or like, oh, they're a triple split, and they're like the milk 
person in there, like delivering to all the houses, and they know everyone in town. Mm -hmm. You know, triple split. I kind of think it was making the rounds. Yeah, totally. So like, there are certain ways we can do it. But I guess I just wanted to point out for me, the bigger picture is just if you aren't splenic like me, you take a long time because you have to kind of not not impulsively jump into things. Then if you're not splenic and you also have, or, or just you do have to find solar plexus regardless of your spleen, mm. you, you better give yourself time for that emotional right. wave. Then if you have a split, you better give yourself time for that split. Mm. If you have a triple split, you better give yourself a lot of time to have those splits mm. in all different yeah, ways. Yeah. Then if you're quad split, you better you better like talk it over with four different people. Yeah, yeah. Four different, like, you need like three different people. Mm. Quad least, split yeah. means four different people, you yeah. know, or something. I mean, you can say at least, but I mean like, it's almost funny, it's like if you have a big decision to make, you know, go hang out with me and I bridge your split one way and then somebody exactly, else, they bridge yeah. it the other way and so on. Um, here, I'm just gonna make this uh, lightning round. Okay, lightning round. <laughs> I should do this more often. Okay, <laughs> lightning round. All right, um, Twitter influencers, Bronx influencers, SZA and Kehlani's Reader, modern oh. day court astrologers. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. This is my Yeah, yeah. This is my This is my like things like Yeah, definitely had this conversation a number of times. Yeah, there's a couple influencers on Twitter who um, got into human design and really blew it up. Probably like I don't know, almost a year ago at this point. Um, and then over time, I kind of, it feels like I kind of saw the thing happening where. Um, where, first of all, there's the backlash to people getting into human design because people have all these objections about it. But then there's also, when you, if, if, they, if these people are like really living the knowledge in daily life, then there's that thing that people go through when they get into human design where they kind of have to take a break from it or something, you know, where like so much starts to go on in your life. You know, there's that insulation period where there can be a lot of chaos and a lot of, um, the, the coarsest layers of the not self kind of fall away, you know, pretty early on. Stuff mm -hmm. that's really obviously wrong for you seems to sort of see itself out with minimal effort on your part, you know? Like you end an obviously wrong relationship, you get out mm -hmm. of an obviously wrong situation, these that, kinds of things. That first year, on. that first yeah. year of chaos, of yeah. difficulty at the beginning. But anyway, so it's almost like because these people have so much influence, it's like, uh, and one of them's like a 4-1 or whatever, so you know there's this externalization. It's like you kind of see the ripple effect of their influence, like they withdraw from the teaching or whatever, maybe because stuff's going on in their lives, and, that's, and that spreads. It's like an in-breath, out-breath of the presence of human design on Twitter, you could say. Hmm. Which is, I don't know, it's just kind of a trippy well, thing to watch. It's just like a, an, yeah. ecos an ecosystem of the knowledge. Being a fourth line also, I mean obviously the influence it looks pretty good, actually. Why all the types need a waiting period? I'm actually like not too disappointed in. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not too. Develop your own it's consistent not too bleak, routine. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too bleak. It's actually pretty. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff mixed in because there's just a lot of like human versions of oh, yeah, the anime characters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so but it's actually pretty excited. Uh, I mean, it's actually pretty exciting. Um, wow. Raw on human design and abortion. The rights over our body should never be up for questioning. Here, here. Yeah, they're like getting to where, yeah, you see, this is raw quote. There's a deep misunderstding, and it's plain that the central part of the theme, the relationship between design crystal and magnetic monopole, they are there before the personality crystal ever arrives. They build the vehicle, they build the fetus, right. they build the mechanism, they build a biomass. A very sophisticated biomass, but nonetheless, what they're building is a biomass. And it's only at the point where the personality crystal enters into the vehicle that the biomass takes on its transcendent nature, that it becomes the potentiality of a human being only then. So yeah, I mean he does like human design does pretty much unequivocally tell you when when the, the fetus becomes a human, and it's really at birth, and then the dreaming Mm. is about a week before, and mm. then the unconscious is about three months before. Mm. So it is interesting that we get these these progressive phases. Right. Well, in any case, I'm actually not too depressed by looking at this Twitter. I usually stay away at, uh, from, you know, because anytime I go on to, um, it's just a bummer sometimes. You go on human design and astrology and you find all these people selling, selling their stuff. Most of what I can't stand oh, is yeah. just seeing the, give me this money and I'll tell you how to use human design to 
jumpstart your business. Right. I made a million bucks last year. I'm making three million this yeah. year. We talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that last yeah. time. We don't need to go over it again. But it's just, it makes me happy that when I a cursory scan of Twitter to me looks pretty legit. Yeah. It's like people are actually like interested. legitimately interested, yeah. legitimately conversing. And, hey, they're digging up stuff on the when the fetus and the yeah, yeah. Of all the personality. And this is great. This yeah. is great. Okay, well, we have two two last ones. Uh, we have an announcement, and then I just have one. I guess I'll do the last. Well, I'll, I'll do the announcement first, and then we'll just do the last bit of lightning round. So the announcement is from James Alexander, uh, although it's also been shared by John Cole, Amy Lee, and Frank Coiner, and the four of them together are doing IDX, the InterDesign Experience. So James writes, we're excited to announce the InterDesign Experience. Have you heard of this yet? You know no, this? what is it? It's pretty new. It's only the last couple of days they announced it. An immersive human design experience in Austin, Texas from June 24th to 26th. Mm. IDX diverges from past immersions and conferences in a variety of ways with an emphasis on experience more than information. This is an opportunity to deepen your grounding in strategy and authority, bridge knowledge and embodiment, and unlock deeper layers of conditioning with others in Aura. Check out the event site for further details. We're looking forward to seeing you there. James Alexander, Amy Lee, Fran Coiner, and John Cole. Five ones and two fours. Excellent. Two five ones, two two fours. Wonderful. Two projectors, two generators. Yeah, it's highly recommended. I think it's um, 650 bucks, which you know is really not that much for when you think about it, what, what you're getting, like, I don't know what kind of turnout they're gonna get, but I imagine it's gonna be very intimate no matter what, and you're gonna get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, and, or at least maybe not with them because they'll be facilitating but with each other. Like, I don't wanna misspeak, but I can just, I can tell. It's a, it's a pretty good deal, and it's, I mean, it's gonna be easier for people who are, are closer to that area and so on, but overall, I looked at the schedule, it looks really cool, you get like sessions, and then there's a, there's a dinner, and there's, it's just going to be really great, and I, I wanted to go out there honestly. June twenty fourth, twenty sixth, I might be able to make it. Mm -hmm. It's just a little tricky because we're doing our own conference in July, and then mm -hmm. I'm also going to be traveling in the month of June. Um, it's just a little tricky, but if I if I can make it, I really want to. Um, okay, and then last one of the lightning round, and then we're going to close it up. Rob's personality type. Uh -huh. I have uh, my guess. Oh, oh, um. Um, I'm going to actually type mine here. Maybe ESTP? Okay. Um, or, yeah, I see ESTP, I guess. Do you think he's extrovert, not, not ISTP? Yeah, I, I was thinking ISTP, but something. I don't know, he's a weird one, isn't he? Oh, I see, you got your whole thing. Yeah, I'm just typing it up. Okay. It's just what I think. But I see. But we'll see. But this is, I've gone back and forth quite a bit. Um, well, he definitely has, he's not an INFJ. Definitely not. Well, nobody says that, but, well, actually, no, I think a few people when I was talking about, no, I've, I don't want to say who says that, but when I was talking in personality type forms, people were saying that he has a very INFJ guru thing. I just say that I have, this is my, this is my guess. I'll just write Jonah's guess. So, I think he's ISTP, because okay. ISTPs grow to look like INFJs. And yeah. I don't think he's INFJ, because he doesn't seem like he's a little control freak. Mm -hmm. He seems more like a misanthrope. Yeah. And oh, ISTPs yeah. tend to have problems with other people. Oh, yeah. Their problems are people-oriented, not thing-oriented. Okay, yeah. They tend to be balanced in, in chaos versus order, right. whereas ESTPs are don't control me, and INFJs are don't break the rule, or whatever, right. they're control freaks. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I do think he's ISTP. I do see how he had to go through tremendous growth and mm -hmm. tremendous change because he speaks with so much extroverted feeling all the time. His dramatic pauses. People say Alok sounds a lot like him, and Alok I think is an ENFJ or an ESFJ or something. You know, so FE lead. Mm -hmm. You know, so how for an ENFJ, the polar opposite of an ISTP, and they sound really similar because they talk like this. Right. And they're saying that the way you have to do it, you know, they're using FE. We don't use FE. So for people who, who know human design but aren't into personality type, I'm using the type codes from Jung's typology, where FE, extroverted feeling, is a way of expressing emotion in your voice. I use TE. Mm -hmm. You use TE. Mm -hmm. You know, we're TE speakers. We don't, well, the thing about it is you have to, you know, it's kind of creepy mm -hmm. when we do that. It's weird. Um, so I definitely think he's an ISTP. I think he's grown tremendously. I think he's FM. 
Mm. I think FM is also a very yeah, unusual yeah, gender code. Um, he definitely, I, I was almost going to say MM, but I, I see him as having this oh, yeah. ectomorphic yeah. feminine body type sure. that's very sensitive and he's very gentle on himself and, and so yeah. on. And then his way of being with other people is very harsh on them. Mm. So he's, you know, I, he said, shouldn't I get a gun in this job? <laughs> you know, at one point, you know, shouldn't this job come with a gun? Yeah, yeah. Really? <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. I have a far out thought. Okay. What if uh, Ross Binary isn't Richard Rudd, it's Steve Jobs? <laughs> oh my god. How is that the binary? Yeah, I don't know. We, just need to, we just need to contemplate on it. Okay. Yeah. You thought it up, I'll do the work on it. <laughs> you think it up, it I'll doesn't, be, It doesn't I'll click be. immediately for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're both ISTPs. <laughs> yeah. I, I but they're both FM like that. that. I think they're both yeah, FM. Yeah, you know? There's something about them and like just the impact and everything, you know? Yeah. I'll have to look up more about Steve Jobs. Is he a manifester? It sure seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah. That was his big um, epiphany when he did his, whatever, Apple Fast and um, and uh, psychedelic trip when he was in college was just the realization that he could poke the poke reality and it would respond or whatever. You know, he I, realized his manifestor ability. Yeah. I can initiate. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else responds I mean, to me. That's an understanding of mechanics in its own way, you know, just used for a yeah. very different purpose. Well, you know, as much as I knock genetic matrix, here they are. He's a 6 3 um, generator. Oh, oh nice. weird. Okay. Emotional um, generator. But he's a 6 3 and uh, wide split, left ankle cross of spirit. Mm. So. 952. But, um, okay, so, and then, but just to, since we are in speed round, I'll finish it up. So mm -hmm. these, I think Ra's missing consume. That's what this next line is. So below ISTP, we have FM, which is the gender code, um, female sensing and masculine extroverted feeling. Mm -hmm. And then we have T-I-N-I, -I. I think he's weed sleep. Mm -hmm. I thought a lot about this and I went around and around in the different ways that Ra was in his life and mm -hmm. so on. I think his biggest thing he was a know-it-all asshole, mm -hmm. and they call sleep last people like myself, oh, the yeah. know-it-alls, they right, call us right. the assholes, they call us, you know, we know everything, we've heard it all before, we don't want to, we don't want anyone, I mean, he's actually the same animal stack as Dave Powers. Mm. So, oh. the sleep last play, and they're like mm -hmm. the most know-it-all of the know-it-all, because when you're talking to them, they're like, wrap it up, wrap mm -hmm. it up, wrap it yeah, up, yeah. I don't want to listen to you, I don't want to listen to you, right. wrap it up. He said, like, he couldn't, like, Rock couldn't stand when people would talk to him or ask him questions during the readings. He's mm -hmm. like, you're paying me for a reading. Yeah. You only have 45 minutes. Just shut up and let me give the reading. Right. right. That was his attitude mm -hmm. very much. You're paying me to last two years. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I think this is also, because he sleep last with missing consume, he's missing ST. Mm -hmm. He's an ISTP who's missing sensing thinking. Mm -hmm. It's his least developed. And he said, mm -hmm. in, in school... Some of the kids, some of the guys got into cars and the other guys got into sex. And I got into sex. Mm. Is the way he put mm. it. Nice. And it's because he has SF and NF. Mm -hmm. gotcha. You know, with his, with his sleep, his sleep is T-I-N-I. Yeah, that's that just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. His blast, mm. his blast then is N-F. Mm. N-I-F-E. Cool. I mean, yeah. he's like blasting yeah, out intuitive yeah. feeling to you. And then his play is S-E. Effie, uh -huh. and so that's why he has a little bit of cool. His hobby is being cool. Uh, gotcha. You know, he's not as cool and sexy and, and so on as the lead, but he at least has it as his hobby. Mm. You know, he's a hobbyist at being cool. Yeah, um, that's And true. I see him as an Enneagram <laughs> 5. A lot of people say he's an 8. Huh. They see the 8-ness of yeah. him. But I see greater than the 8 is the fear of feeling. Mm -hmm. he, don't make me feel. Mm -hmm. An 8 is like, I'm okay as long as I'm the strongest, and you're okay as long as you know I'm the strongest, mm -hmm. as long as you know you're not stronger than me. Mm -hmm. And he definitely has eight in his tri-type. I put that eight wing seven as part of his tri-type. But I see him as a five wing four, the iconoclast. Mm -hmm. You know, he was an iconoclast. They're like the natural yeah. heretic of the Enneagram. They're mm -hmm. the ones who go out there and they, they have really tumultuous, intense passion, but ultimately they don't want to be in feeling. They mm -hmm. want to be, and they, the other reason I put him as a five is because they have the most understanding of the sacredness of life. There are fives who will devote their whole life to studying a particular type of snail. Mm. study a particular corner of some ocean a cool. particular you yeah, know yeah. they zoom in on the natural world they love the natural world they mm. love science they're mm -hmm. information sponges oh, they have yeah. voracious appetites for knowledge and he knew so much he watched the news he was a news addict I mean, right, right. he was just really voraciously five and so I think he does have the eight wing seven and I also think he has the four wing five for, mm. for his mm. heart fix I think is the four because mm. he may have had helper qualities as he developed his eight but he was not at his core a helper. 
He may have had achievement qualities, as he made a bunch of money earlier in life, but he was not. What he was was a totally unique, eccentric mm -hmm. bohemian. Right. And the Four Wing Five is nicknamed the Bohemian. Mm, so yeah. I'm pretty settled on this. I mean, this yeah, is like multiple good. years yeah. of analysis. I've mm -hmm. finally come around to this is Ra's personality type. And, you know, if you have other ideas, I'd love to hear about it. And then we will finish up, but I just want to read a tiny little bit about it. And this will be the last. If you have any comments, jump in. But I just want to read this the 458, and uh, this is from user LastRevio on slash r slash Enneagram. And so LastRevio writes the 458, or, you know, in this case, the 584. Anyways, mm -hmm. the scholar archetype. Basic fear of being brainwashed. Cool. This is so him. Yeah, <laughs> like his great. entire fear of the program yeah. brainwashing him. Of being controlled and manipulated. Mm -hmm. Of being dependent on untrusted or hated people, of being ordinary, of not having independent thought, mm. of being ignorant, of not being listened to, of being underestimated, mm -hmm. of being inadequate, and losing their free expression or being censored. Mm. These are their core fears. Does this not sound like raw? Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is like so much. And they say it's the darkest archetype. It's the darkest of the dark. The mm -hmm. 458, the 548. These are the three like dark, dark yeah. or evil or hardcore, yeah. whatever you want to call it. These are like the goth, the evil, mm -hmm. the dark. Yeah. I mean, for him to be the darkest of the dark, there's yeah. no other tri-type that yeah, is yeah. any darker than this. Right. That's cool. Subject to rapid oscillations of emotion and thought. Equally capable of preternatural strength and weakness of mind. One minute an angel, the next a cruel tyrant. Lots of love and lots of hate. Yeah. Exquisitely <laughs> sensitive, but all too capable of cruelty and callousness. Oh, yeah. Peculiarly subject to flex. They have different real selves. Independent, dark, cynical, eccentric, creative, swinging between detachment and emotionality. Others are surprised when the aggressive eight appears, as they seem so quiet. And then the eight comes out, the anger. An impenetrable inner world. Complex individuals characterized by the way they push everyone away from them. Mm -hmm. Intellectual narcissists. Mm -hmm. Reactive temperamental. Such fives find it hard to control their emotions, harder than any other tri-type, because the eights lets it all out and the four is so emotional. Mm -hmm. So there are five that are going around full of emotion. They are basically sensitive, reclusive, and ingenious. Mm -hmm. yep. This is so raw. Like, right. Is this yeah. not like this narrative? Yeah. They occasionally indulge in romantic daydreams and fantasies, but once in a while their fierce, visceral side reveals itself explosively and gets to surprise people who don't know them. Mm. These fives are usually selfish and whimsical, considering themselves entitled to special treatment, which they sometimes claim aggressively. They are prone to mood swings and outbursts of rage. The typical subtype, the sexual self prez mm. which makes a lot of sense for him, or mm. self prez sexual, one mm. of the two. Yeah, yeah. Definitely low on social. Innovative, temperamental, egocentric, and intense. Mm. So, yeah. That's it. <laughs> well, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, please post any thoughts, comments, anything at all uh, in the YouTube comment thread. And uh, until next time.